Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, thank you very much. So, um, I have written um, three books about Bruce Lee. Two of those books are academic research monographs, and one is an official biography uh, that you might be more inclined to call a coffee table book. Um, it contains more pictures than words, um, and I had zero editorial or creative control over it, and only basic authorial uh, input. So upon, upon first being asked to write that book, I worried, genuinely worried about what it might do to my academic reputation. Um, however, if, if you love Bruce Lee and Bruce Lee Enterprises ask you to do something on Bruce Lee, you may find yourself very inclined to say yes. At least I certainly did uh, back, back then. Um, anyway, the point that I'm driving at is this. After having written so many thousands of words on the subject, anyone might reasonably wonder um, what more I could possibly have to say on Bruce Lee. Uh, I've certainly wondered this myself uh, on more than one occasion. Surely by now I must um, have said everything I could possibly have to say about Bruce Lee. Uh, and then I wonder, might, might I be the kind of person who's just happy to say the same things over and over again? Or is there something that I'm still trying to get at or spit out that I can't find? In thinking about this, um, I realised that there are things that other people sometimes seem to think I haven't said about Bruce Lee. Some of these questions are posed uh, out there generally in the real world, AKA online. Uh, all of these questions are posed directly to me. Um, so thinking about whether and or why I might never have formally, publicly, academically in writing answered the pressing questions that are posed by so many people so often has precipitated some self-reflection. Have I really never faced up to these things? Why not? Is it avoidance or denial? Do I not actually know how to answer these evidently most pressing of questions? Can I really not settle these unsettled matters? Whatever the answer, surely my silence on these matters cannot continue. So I've decided to face up to the most widely asked and evidently most pressing questions about Bruce Lee here and now. What are these questions? There may be many questions about Bruce Lee, but in my experience, there are five eternally returning questions that I regularly encounter about Bruce Lee. Of these, there are two that vie for first place in terms of being most frequently directed to me. The other three questions occur in no particular order. I will list these questions first. Of these three no particular order questions, two are related. One goes like this. Really, how good a martial artist was Bruce Lee? Or, how good a martial artist was Bruce Lee really? <laughs> there is a strong emphasis on the word really here. A second frequently asked question, uh, it's different, but it's undoubtedly related. It's a species of the really or reality genus of question. Um, you almost, certainly all already know it. It runs like this. Who would have won in a fight? Bruce Lee or Muhammad Ali? <coughs> so this is the first pair of questions, very frequently asked online, sometimes posed to me. The third question asked about Bruce Lee, the one that I personally am most frequently asked, is this. Why are you into Bruce Lee? Why are you into Bruce Lee? <laughs> Now, although I'm sure I've, I've answered this uh, in many different ways, both in writing and on camera, I should point out that the question of why I'm into Bruce Lee is one that normally comes from people who have only recently met me, and certainly people who haven't seen or read anything I've written or appeared in. Nonetheless, I will still try to answer this pressing question here. Indeed, it should um, begin to answer itself as I engage the other questions, of which there are two more. These are joint equal contenders for first place in the running order of questions most frequently posed to me about Bruce Lee. They are in no particular order. How did Bruce Lee die? And which one is Bruce Lee again? <laughs> Am I thinking of Bruce Lee or Jackie Chan? Surprisingly, both of these questions can be asked by the same person, often in quick succession. Everyone wants to know how he died. 
Even people who start from uncertainty about which one Bruce Lee is and who need to disambiguate him from Jackie Chan often quickly go on to ask about his death. Admittedly, this second question is undoubtedly uh, often suggested by my answer to the question of which one Bruce Lee is. As I can hear myself having said to many people, Jackie Chan, where's Luke, sorry Luke, Jackie Chan does the slapstick stuff and was in the 2010 remake of The Karate Kid. Bruce Lee did Enter the Dragon and died in 1973 and so on. Silently and in my own head, I'm also saying, Bruce Lee is the awesome one <laughs> who changed the world by launching uncountable thousands and millions of martial arts activities, obsessions, fantasies and careers around the world with his inspirational fight choreography. This is where my apology is relevant. Jackie Chan is the one who slapstick, slapstick chop socky essentially sent out the message that martial arts are to be laughed at. You can, you can <laughs> beat me up later, right? Yeah. Oh, you... <laughs> <laughs> Already then, <laughs> I've started to answer the question of why I'm into Bruce Lee and not Jackie Chan. Or less so, or differently. I am into Jackie Chan a bit, but it's very different order of interest. The point is, maybe the, my answer to the question of who, in which I've often mentioned that he died in 1973, is the very thing that leads people to ask the question of how he died. Um, I don't think this is always the case, but at least sometimes it might be, because even when people aren't sure which one Bruce Lee is or was, the one thing they do seem to know is that someone called Bruce Lee died prematurely. But maybe there's no objectivity to my sense that this is a frequently asked question, or that it necessarily follows the question of who or which one Bruce Lee actually is or was. Maybe all of the questions that I have suggested are regularly and widely asked about Bruce Lee are really only regularly and widely directed at me. And perhaps they are only asked at all because people are polite and because I, whether consciously or unconsciously, intentionally or unintentionally, so frequently manage to bring conversations around to Bruce Lee. <laughs> so maybe my sense of eternally recurring questions is a misapprehension. Maybe rather than uh, on objectivity uh, or even on an objectively existing independent object such as Bruce Lee, our focus should always remain acutely aware of how objectivity and subjectivity conjure each other up produce each other as senses, interact and become implicated in each other, or even just on how social interactions and polite conversations and contexts work. For academics, however, any kind of speculation about objectivity can open out onto methodological matters, raising problems that range from the premises to the limitations or parameters of this or that approach, all the way through to reflections on the very possibility or impossibility of definitively establishing anything about anything. Whatever your style, your academic style, your discipline, certainly it is important to remain aware that the world intermingles, that often things that we may initially have regarded as separate, such as objective and subjective perhaps, or Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan, or Bruce Lee and Muhammad Ali, or even Bruce Lee and me, or you, are actually connected, sometimes mutually or reciprocally constitutive and often in ways that make our initial sense or act of separation seem naive, misguided or blinkered. But if people and things really can, as Bruce Lee said, be water or at least like water, then we should also remember that as well as seeming pure, water cannot but become contaminated, cannot but infuse and become infused by and with the things it touches. We must be aware that even the vastest expanses of water in the world are not simply water. Rather, as I once heard a scientist say, seawater is not water. Seawater is a dilute solution of everything in the world. As such, maybe the philosophical profundity or platitude that everything is in everything, an idea that runs wide and deep from interpretations of Taoism to theories of education, from radical post-structuralism to hippie ideologies and beyond, is indeed both the call for and the kiss of death for methodologies in the study of potentially anything. But, deconstructive as I am, let's not get too carried away or contaminated by our ocean size or wishy-washy watery metaphor. After all, it was only a minor reflection on the co-implication and cross-contamination of objectivity and subjectivity that precipitated this. So let's simply entertain a couple of questions. Either there are widely arising 
widely interesting and widely posed and reposed questions about Bruce Lee, or there are not. If there are widely posed questions, such, as que such questions can nonetheless arise and seem to be burning issues only within certain contexts. We might contextualize such a context as field, habitus, symbolic order or subculture and so on, or even just as moves, moments or speech acts in conversations. Surely it can only be within a context, whether stable or fleeting, that any question about Bruce Lee might seem widely posed or interesting or important. For everyone else, everywhere else, either the tide of interest in Bruce Lee might have gone out or such a tide might never have reached them. Hence, some people care passionately about Bruce Lee while others don't know who he is or was and might at best struggle to separate him from other prominent figures in the paradigm we might politely call Asian martial arts actors, such as Jackie Chan, Brandon Lee, Sonny Chiba, Jet Li, Donnie Yen, Tony Ja, Iko Aues, and so on. Those who are, um, those who are and those who are not able to disambiguate Bruce Lee from Jackie Chan might themselves be diagnosed or placed in different ways. A Bourdieuian approach might place them in different positions in relation to inside or outside a certain field. The field would be a closed economy in which knowledge of Bruce Lee would confer some kind of significant or baseline cultural capital. Many people in martial arts studies today seem to accept this now classic sociological approach and still use it whenever possible. However, to my mind, it implies a level of stability, certainty or fixity about a field and positions within and around it, all of which may be little other than theoretical fictions. There are similar insights and problems related to diagnoses or cartographies that rely on notions of subculture and or in relation to a dominant culture. This is why, um, like the habitus approach, I tend to avoid the subculture approach to um, instead, I've always preferred a discursive approach to the description and exploration of identities, statuses, relative positions and values. This is not least because the metaphor of discourse implies movement, conversation, conversion, formations, deformations, transformations, and constellations. But in either case, it seems safe to say um, that it will mainly be those already in the know or in the thrall at some base or entry level who will ask direct questions about Bruce Lee. To put this differently, those who are not in the know and not in the thrall of Bruce Lee are those who are most likely to ask the questions, which one is Bruce Lee again? And or why are you into Bruce Lee? To those who know about Bruce Lee, there is less likely to be a need to ask why I am into him. It's likely to be obvious or to go without saying. Similarly, his difference from any and all other martial arts film stars will be obvious too. It's this constituency who are more likely to worry about whether Bruce Lee was really any good, who he could really have beaten in a fight, and why he died at the young age he did. Nonetheless, by far the greatest number of people in the world would be those um, who would have difficulty disambiguating Bruce Lee from other Asian martial arts stars. As Davis Miller points out in his millennial Bruce Lee biography come autobiography, relatively few people in the world today have actually seen a Bruce Lee film, and this was mentioned by someone this morning. Um, somewhat perversely, therefore, um, this suggests rather surprisingly that in face-to-face -face conversation with me, far more people in the world would be likely to ask me who Bruce Lee is and why I'm into him. This means that in a real situation, in the real world, a situational question about me might be objectively more likely to occur than a direct question about the incontrovertibly, massively more well-known global icon, Bruce Lee. This paradoxical situation exists even though were virtually anyone in the world to be asked a question about me, the statistically certain response would be, who? Yet this is how contexts work, in the real world, on the ground, in reality. This is no doubt part of the reason why notions of virtuality, planes of imminence, and even ideas from quantum theory have long been so uh, appealing and stimulating to cultural theorists and philosophers. One thing can only happen if another thing happens. One thing can appear to be bigger than another or more forceful or more present, even though it isn't, like me compared to Bruce Lee or Bruce Lee compared to Muhammad Ali. Our experience of the world is radically perspectival, objectively subjective, subjectively objective, <coughs> as is the behavior of the world. And this is why my response to all or most questions about Bruce Lee often have a vaguely quantum or quadratic plus and or minus feel to them. Like a subatomic particle in trying to measure the actual position or velocity of Bruce Lee, something about him moves. 
If I put Bruce Lee in a theoretical box, with or without Schrodinger's cat, whenever I may or may not open it, he may or may not be what he once was. So when it comes to a question like, really, how good a martial artist was Bruce Lee, or how good a martial artist was Bruce Lee, really? Although I can say that there has never been a time that I believed he was not very good, as Lee himself observed in that famous interview, if, if he were to say that he was no good, we would know he was lying. I can and do nonetheless vacillate from thinking he was exceptional, to thinking on screen he appears exceptional, to thinking very little is actually known for certain about his relatively few reported fights, so it's unverifiable, to thinking not only did he, like any sensible grown-up, evidently avoid real fights, some testimonials claim that he also appeared to develop a principled refusal to test or demonstrate his fighting skills in any free, open, or indeed fair format. His evident predilection for showing off seems equally matched by a certain refusal to demonstrate freely, a refusal to be put to the test other than in his own terms. This can doubtless be taken numerous ways. Davis Miller reports that the martial artist Joe Lewis claimed he was once set up to lose by Bruce Lee, just so Lee could practice what came to be the famous sequence uh, he uses in his fight against Bob Walls O'Hara in Enter the Dragon. According to Lewis, Lee asked him to throw a certain three-punch combination at him. Lewis obliged and Lee blocked. Lee asked him to do it again. Same thing. And again. On the third iteration, Lee not only blocked, but countered full force with the backfist combination that later came to be immortalized on screen. Lewis evidently became somewhat bitter about this because, as he reported to Miller afterwards, many of the people who witnessed the exchange went around saying that they had seen Bruce Lee beat up world <laughs> champ Joe Lewis. However, according to Lewis, Bruce Lee never sparred freely with anyone, apart from some who would, in Lewis's words, suck up to him. According to Lewis, when it came to fighting or even sparring, it was never that open with Bruce, never entirely honest or straightforward. But why would a great fighter or great martial artist conceal his fighting or her fighting or martial arts abilities? There are as many possible answers to this question as there are to its inverse. The question of why a terrible fighter or absolute non-martial artist would like to suggest that they are, in actual fact, really, deep down, secretly, a great fighter or great martial artist. This has to do with the manipulation of appearances, the power of suggestion or indeed seduction or what Baudrillard called the lure, to put out and or call back ideas of being super tough or super skilled in these waters is to manipulate, conjure, play with, trade in or manipulate fear, fantasy and desire, one's own and one's others. Before Baudrillard, Guy Debord proposed that in the society of the spectacle, both being and having would eventually lose out to appearing. When we see Eddie Murphy's character, Billy Ray Valentine, in a jail cell in trading places, loudly mouthing off and claiming to have defeated multiple police officers before being tear gassed and arrested, we see one side of this performance, the claim and affectation of skill as both deterrent and cultural status raiser. So let's, let's hope this works.
Um, so that's one side of that's one side of uh, the performance uh, of the claim to be um, an excellent martial artist. Conversely, when we see I couldn't find a clip for the next bit. Conversely, when we see Richard Gears Mayo in an officer and a gentleman repeating emphatically, "I do not want to fight you. I do not want to fight you," or indeed Bruce Lee's own, "Don't waste yourself." Um, in Enter the Dragon. We see the other side. The apparent attempt to de-escalate that nonetheless strongly implies superior ability. Some of, us will, some of us will recall that kid at school who was eyed with caution because they were merely said to be, or said of themselves that they were, a black belt in this or that exotic sounding art. Some of us will also know or have known a supposed martial arts master who taught or teaches many classes and even many styles, but who never spars even privately with their own students. All such characters inhabit realms of uncertainty, unverifiability or unverifiedness. All conjure with fear and desire as deterrence and attraction. How we judge this kind of thing depends on how or whether we interpret the artistry component that sits quietly in the term martial arts. We tend to think that we want our martial arts and martial artists principally to be martial even though reali realistically, most likely, we really don't. Martial refers to military warfare, and all such matters are murderous, monstrous, machinic, morbid, and other words beginning with M. Indeed, when we evoke martial arts, we tend not to be thinking of war, but rather of combat and conflict that is interpersonal, one-to-one, -one, stand up, face-to-face, -face, civilian, and non-lethal. This is not very martial at all, really. So uh, this is so much so that when it comes to martial arts as we think of them today, surely it has to be said that the artistry is the thing. Even when that artistry is self-styled as supposedly having no style, or no artistry, only efficiency, there is always artistry, even in its disavowal. Furthermore, and more pertinent uh, for the many martial artists who like to read select bits of Bruce Lee's filmic martial artistry as providing literal or allegorical lessons, didn't Bruce Lee famously state that he supposed you'd call the style that he practiced the art of fighting without fighting? Why do we not believe these words and this sequence of Enter the Dragon, even though so many of us are so prepared to regard so many other bits of Lee's screen performances as lessons? The parameters of an art of fighting without fighting could easily range from tricking a bully off the boat to any kind of deception, pose, distraction, simulation, manipulation, and pretense. Of course, like everything else that Lee reputedly said, or may or may have not been the author of, it's unclear whether he could be said to have meant these words, seriously, directly, or literally. There's evidence that Lee seems to have meant, or at least really enjoyed, all the B-water stuff, but did he actually mean the fighting without fighting stuff, or believe it, really? After all, the person who said it was really only the film's character, Mr. Lee, not the real Bruce Lee. Yet Bruce Lee, as his as he himself, his family, friends, estate, aficionados and heirs, all keep claiming, would continually strive to honestly express his real and true philosophies and ideas in his films and TV roles. From the lecture about the way of the intercepting fist in Longstreet, to the lesson allegedly encoded in the fight with Chuck Norris's Colt in Way of the Dragon, all the way to the speech about the ultimate tech being to have no technique and the don't think, feel lesson with Lao, Bruce Lee on screen is often read as if his words and performances constitute some kind of documentary, some kind of Bible, or some kind of manual. Clearly, however, like the Bible, Bruce Lee is often, perhaps necessarily, read selectively and without a rationale for that selectivity. Why do we select the bits that we do? What would happen if we were to try to read him rigorously and coherently? If we all sat down and tried to read Bruce Lee as if from or for one consistent or coherent position, while trying to handle and incorporate all of the many different and contradictory bits that we have all at once to try to build one complete image, I think that we would not only struggle, but also all produce very different images, figures, characters, values, and interpretations. This is because the idea of the one, the totally knowable and accessible to totality, is a fiction. This is why I prefer instead to regard the inevitability of selectivity and incompleteness as a kind of necessary and inevitable principle. We have to accept that we only ever pick out and pick up bits and pieces of culture 
or of a text or practice, even if we think we have the whole thing. There will always be different senses of the whole, dependent on which bits and pieces are picked out and picked up in which kinds of ways for what kinds of reasons. We combine different bits and pieces paratactically in different configurations, and what we pick up or pick out inevitably both reveals and conceals. Of course, this still doesn't answer the question of how good a martial artist or fighter Bruce Lee actually was. And we live in an era where straight talking is allegedly of the highest value. So what do I say? I want to say ingenious, that Bruce Lee was an ingenious martial artist. I think that this is all the more so given that he is gone um, and everything remains uncertain, yet his shadow or wake still stretches or flows far and wide and influentially. As if in frustration comes the question, okay then, who would have won in a fight? Bruce Lee or Muhammad Ali? This question snatches out and grabs an apparently valid and realistic contrast or comparison. Muhammad Ali, who was alive and more or less in his prime in and around the time of the fame, i.e. The, me the immediate posthumous fame of Bruce Lee. Ali was, of course, also another, so to speak, ethnic celebrity in an era of the scarcity of non-white public figures. So the choice of comparison may be ethnically overdetermined. Certainly no one has ever asked me who would have won in a fight, Bruce Lee or Henry Cooper? But who else from that era does everybody know who seems to have a recognized claim on being the greatest? So who would have won in a fight between Lee and Ali? Surely it's a simple question. Surely it can be answered. Certainly we can easily isolate and enumerate elements for comparison and play a game of fantasy fighting league top trumps. Ali was massive and could have punched Lee's head clean off his shoulders. Yes, but Bruce Lee was as fast as lightning and could snatch Ali's eyes out of their sockets while kicking a cat out of the tree, and so on. Crucially, in this theoretical physics, we come to the fact that Ali was a world champion heavyweight boxer with an enduring international career, while Lee was as light as a feather and had not fought competitively since one tournament in high school. Consequently, I want to say that it's obvious who would have won. However, history also records the occasion when Ali the boxer fought Inoki the wrestler. In this case, it strikes me as crucial to note that this was a complete non-event, a complete flop, both as a test of ability and as a spectacle. It was a flop re uh, reputedly because of a misunderstanding of the nature of the event. Ali and his camp apparently believed the event was going to be pure spectacle and not a real competition. Inoki and, Inoki and his camp believed it was going to be an all-out fight to the knockout or submission with each fighter using his own or the other's discipline, a kind of UFC avant la lettre. The situation as it transpired involved Ali's camp arriving for the fight and asking when the rehearsal would be. When the penny dropped that everyone else believed that this was meant to be a real contest, all kinds of last minute rule changes were brought in, ostensibly to ensure that the most valuable commodity, Ali, was protected from possible damage. The rules imposed on the fight resulted in the embarrassing spectacle of Inoki having to try to throw kicks while lying on his back as this was all that the rules really allowed in terms of kicks. This is the same as to say that even Ali, a world-class competitive boxer, would and did, for one reason or another, shy away from truly open contest outside of the rules and realm of the boxing ring. So really then, as at least part of our answer, we have to ask, how likely is the possibility of such a fight, as they say in the real world? If reality is really what concerns us, then we really must remain aware that there are considerably more complex factors to consider than decontextualized and effectively abstract matters of physical size, speed, reach, style, and skill. The very possibility of such a fight, not to mention the fantasy structure of the romantic notion of a real and true fair fight per se, plus myriad other considerations, must all be weighed and measured in what remains our irreducibly fantasy fighting league. To disagree with this kind of thing is actually to move ever, ever further from the real world that is nonetheless being fantasized and fetishized. At the very least, given the strength of what we might call the forces or impulses of concealment and forces uh, relating to preserving or enhancing commercial, physical, pedagogical, and other performative capital, asking who would have won seems a little like asking which pole of a magnet would have won if we had pushed two equal yet opposite poles together when each of the poles operated in different realms and had different careers and reputations to maintain. Perhaps this force of concealment, this game of suggestion, coquetry, peekaboo, or fort da, also goes some way to answering the eternally returning question of why I am into Bruce Lee. 
Certainly the sense of always holding something back, of there always being apparently more in reserve has always been appealing to me. But is this why I'm into Bruce Lee? Because he was always and remains to some crucial degree unknown and now because he died so young, unknowable. Um, at this point, I have cut a long digressive anecdote about me and Bruce Lee and undecidability and psychoanalysis. Uh, I've cut it for two reasons, because uh, first, to skip the working out, the short answer is basically yes, I think so, at least a bit. And second, because the appeal of Lee is often held to have a lot to do with the supposed million dollar question of how he died. Um, I certainly dispute the thesis that his untimely death somehow caused his appeal. It certainly created an openness that allowed for ever more imaginary identity work, but it does not in any way explain his attractiveness. Nonetheless, his death is supposed to be the unsettled matter, um, of course. It's, it's supposed to involve mystery or conspiracy, even, there are really, even though there are really only a couple of credible possibilities, and both boil down to much the same thing. Bruce Lee either had some kind of allergic reaction to something, either cannabis or aspirin, or heat, as Matthew Polly recently argued, relatively persuasively in his book, Heat Stroke. For a long time, I accepted the allergic reaction to cannabis diagnosis advocated by a pathologist involved with the case. However, at our 2015 conference, the surgeon, Mr. Hutan Ashrafian, offered an analysis of the clinical events based on all available evidence and proposed instead Ray's syndrome or an adult Ray's-like syndrome. Ray's syndrome was unknown in 1973, but is now well known uh, as is its link to aspirin in young athletes. Put bluntly, it's now well established that one best not give aspirin to young athletes and young martial artists during times of viral illness or it could cause all kinds of problems, including cerebral edema. This was not known in 1973, or heat stroke, right? Given the existence of several um, equally plausible and medically viable theories, I personally can settle for this kind of uncertainty. Any of them are acceptable to me because I believe all are equally plausible. Obviously, um, they're all equally startling because in any case, Bruce Lee died from a rare allergic reaction to one or another relatively mundane drug or from heat. But on this issue again, things bifurcate and double, one thing into its opposite. I personally can accept that Lee died because of either cause or any of these causes. Many others cannot. This is because they cleave to an image of Lee or have investments in it. For some people, Bruce Lee cannot have been the kind of person to take cannabis, not to mention taking steroids or being unfaithful. For others, he cannot not have been such a person. Exploration of these investments and passions around such images and attachments will always be revealing. And of course, what will be revealed will always have as much to do with the subject as the object. In these waters, there's never just Bruce Lee. There's only ever my Bruce Lee, your Bruce Lee, their Bruce Lee, and so on. Of course, this explains what it would mean to say that Bruce Lee both did and did not die. Like Darth Vader or some dark pharmacon, aspirin, heat, or cannabis unexpectedly strikes down Bruce Lee's Obi-Wan, which is precisely why he becomes more powerful than you could possibly imagine. Everywhere and nowhere, forever known and unknown, the very stuff of fantasy, the muse, the ego ideal, against which for unknown and unknowable numbers, in untold and uncountable ways, everything can be tested, yet nothing verified. Like everything else, like water, because of any identity's fundamental constitutive and ongoing openness to the other, Lee intermingled and intermingles with ideas and identities and inevitably with other issues. In some contexts, this is so much so that when attempting to establish, separate or disambiguate origins, identities or essences, the question becomes, what of this here is me or he or she and what is or is of Bruce Lee and which Bruce Lee? Which bit of Bruce Lee is this Bruce Lee? However, I don't really want to end on the topic of identity. To echo Homer Simpson's immortal observation that beer is the cause and solution to all of life's problems, it's too easy to position identity as the problem and solution to all issues in cultural studies. Instead, I want to conclude by returning to the supposedly subjective or relative matter of identity, um, but rather to the supposedly objective matter of reality. And I want to answer my five questions directly, without hesitation, deviation, repetition, or any of that unpleasant deconstructive complication. 
However, it seems that the only thing that can possibly emerge from an insistence on a direct and unmediated engagement with reality wants to appear less like gritty realism and more like some kind of poetry, or indeed like a sequence of Zen koans. Hours run like this. How good a martial artist was Bruce Lee really? He ingeniously concealed in revealing and revealed in concealing. Who would have won in a fight, Bruce Lee or Muhammad Ali? The frustration of your fantasy and its symptomatic misconstrual of reality. Why are you into Bruce Lee? Bruce Lee got into me. How did Bruce Lee die? Cerebral edema, he didn't. Which one is Bruce Lee again? Precisely. Am I thinking of Bruce Lee or Jackie Chan? Neither and both, bits and pieces, recombinations, snapshots, snatches, phrases, exchanges, gifts, memes, themes, dreams, with additions, extras added, supplements, projections, displacements, replacements, reflections, all adding up, not to a whole, but to ever more holes with ever more holes, all continuously giving, taking, offering, answering, suggesting, promising and or asking something more. But one final question, is this really, ev this is for me really, is this really everything you ever wanted to know about Bruce Lee? Sometimes all of this seems to be more about me, but doesn't that seem to at least reflect part of everything you ever wanted to know?